Hello and welcome to this edition of Assembly Calendar. I'm Matt Vischer. Our guest today is New York State Assemblyman Jim Tedisco, who represents the 112th Assembly District of Schenectady and uh, Saratoga Counties. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we're sitting down with the Assemblyman to discuss uh, some of the latest happenings going on in his district and uh, sort of catch up with what's been going on with him. Nice to see you, sir. Always good to see you. We're breaking a few records with the heat, but we'll be begging for it. 90 we degree get weather here in Albany. That Albania. winter weather we got last time. Keep our fingers crossed it's not as cold. We had the, I think we had the frost down below about five feet and pipes were breaking as I remember uh, last December. Yes. But hopefully that'll Quite be. Quite the contrast. We'll get a few more nice days and uh, the weather will be uh, a little bit lesser for us. Uh, bring us up to speed in terms of what you've been up to over the past few weeks. Well, the past couple of weeks I've been thinking about uh, my job as a public servant. You know, a lot of people will come up to you and they see uh, what's happening at the federal level. They're watching these debates. They're watching Donald Trump buy into the frustration of the public on the national level. And they have their own set of frustrations on the state level. And there's frustrations with elected officials on the local level. And you begin to think about uh, your public service role and why you got involved to begin with and what your role continues to be. And uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, I had some serious thoughts about that. I, I realized that uh, first got into public service uh, as an educator and then moved on to a city council member, as you know, for five years. And then I've been in the New York State Assembly for uh, a number of terms right now and through four different redistrictings. And uh, this last Labor Day, uh, I begin to think a little bit about my dad more so than often. Uh, served in Atlanta, New Guinea, was a part of the armed forces, World War II, then came back to this uh, community and served at the General Electric in one of the most difficult jobs you could ever have. Uh, terrible condition, worked in the foundry for 40 years but uh, taught me a little bit about the work ethic. I'll never forget uh, when I was at Bishop Gibbons High School, happened to love basketball, even at five foot eight, loved basketball, played it, practiced it. Just had, uh, you know, when you enjoy something, you're good at it, you tend to work at it. And uh, was at Gibbons and basketball was doing great. I think I was a sophomore, but the studies weren't doing too good. I'll never forget the day my father walked into my bedroom about 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning and said, Jimmy, get up, get dressed. Uh, you're going to spend a day at the foundry with me today. I go at the foundry. Yeah, he goes, I want you to come down and see the way the work goes in the foundry. I said, uh, not going to school? No, you're not going to go to school today. So I figured a day in the foundry might be better than a day in school. How wrong I could ever have been. Mm -hmm. Took me down the foundry and uh, took me into the changing room and uh, said, put on these work clothes. I said, well, I don't need it. No, you have to wear these work clothes. I put on the work clothes. He put on his work clothes. And we opened the door to go into the foundry. And I kind of hesitated when I looked in there because the soot was so thick, you couldn't see five or 10 feet in front of you. When you got out into the foundry, you couldn't hardly see the next person in front of you. Red hot molten steel going over our heads and uh, just the worst conditions you could ever think of. He goes, now, get over there and sit down. And uh, I'm going to be doing some work. And I watched him work on machinery and, and uh, watched that uh, soot flying all, all over the place. And uh, we had a little lunch, and then we continued. When the, when the uh, eight-hour shift got done, we went back into the locker room. <clears throat> and uh, he goes, now take a look in the mirror. I looked in the mirror, and my face and all my clothes were full of soot. And then he looked at me and gave me a whole bunch of Kleenex. He pulled it and goes, now, uh, I think this has to be said, although it's kind of graphic. He said, blow your nose. And I blew my nose into that Kleenex, and chunks of dirt and soot came mm. out about that thick. And I looked over at my father, and I realized I love this man more than I could ever love anybody in my entire life who would sacrifice that. At that time, he was there for about 30 years. He spent 40 years in that condition in the foundry every single day. And he looked at me, and he said, uh, look, you got two choices. You either go back to Bishop Gibbons High School, get your grades, maybe go on to college, get a degree, do something, Oh, I got a job for you. I'll be able to get you a job down here in the foundry. Well, you know what the answer to that was. I went back and got A-plus for my junior and senior year. I got a scholarship to Union College, broke a lot of records at Union College, got my degree in psychology, went on to be an educator for 10 years. But uh, when people say, uh, why did you become a public servant? He's the primary reason why I became a public servant. Because a man that could sacrifice that much for his family and for his community and working under those conditions I knew that I wanted to do my things that were possible to serve my community in any way I could because your community is an extended family. And the reason why I talk about that is I was reminded about that a couple weeks ago when a dear friend of mine and a constituent of mine 
and I would call a community hero. His name was Doug Lyle, and he was married, is married, was married to Mary Lyle. He passed away two weeks ago. I met Doug and Mary Lyle in the Lyle family 17 years ago. And for those viewers who are listening right now, that probably rings a bell with them. If not, we can remind them that their daughter, Suzanne Lyle, has been missing from Albany State University for 17 years. Disappeared <coughs> without a trace. Disappeared without a trace, as many families across the state and across the 50 states across this nation and around this world. It's a problem. Abduction, murder, uh, missing family members, missing loved ones. And... Uh, I see him as I saw my father as uh, what I would call a modern day hero, Doug Lyle. Because Doug Lyle, 17 years ago, with his lovely wife Mary, could have done for what for the grace of God we would have done. If it was our son, our daughter, our niece, our nephew, our brother, our sister, mm -hmm. our father, our mother, maybe crawled into a, a little ball and just uh, had hatred and bitterness. Didn't do that. They refused to be victims. What they did is turn their personal tragedy Doug Lyle and Mary Lyle, and that's why it's, it reminded me so much of my dad, and the 9-11 survivors as well as those who lost their loves that day. And we'll talk a little bit about that because 9-11 is coming up. He took that personal tragedy along with Mary and the family and turned it into something unbelievably positive for the family members, not only of this state who are facing this quiet desperation of this tra tragedy, but across this nation. I mean, we could go a whole show here, the time we have left, talking about their accomplishments. Legislation in the state of New York and a national level. We have a Missing Persons Day because of Doug and Mary La. We have a, a memorial, one of the first memorials with an ever-burning amber here that m commemorates and helps us to remember the legacy and the fact that families are suffering this quiet desperation. We actually have conference every single year at the museum, which I'm honored to be the Toastmaster at and lead where Doug and Mary bring the families in for counseling and working with law enforcement and uh, just move up to recently 75,000 coasters are in taverns and restaurants in the capital region with the pictures of 17 missing persons of family members kids are going to see that family members are going to see that when they go just to get a soda or put a glass on the table the pictures of the missing persons in their family in the capital region information about them because one little incident might trigger information that could lead to uh, qualming that quiet desperation of not knowing which is the most difficult thing of having a missing person in your life 75 th that's Doug Lyle and Mary Lyle that's his legacy mm -hmm. and uh, uh, turn that personal tragedy into something so positive for other people. Could have been bitter, as I said. Could have recoiled. Could have just uh, been angry at everybody, but didn't. Made the difference in other people's lives. And the reason why I mention that is we have people, as we look at the lost lives and commemorate them in 9-11, uh, the show may air even after that, but we'll, we're going to be having ceremonies in Schenectady and Saratoga County. We remember their legacy, those lives. We remember those lives ma made a difference in other people's lives, that they upholded the greatest parts of America, our freedom and liberty. Uh, but we also have to be mindful that that uh, uh, assault is still out there, that terrorism is still out there, that there are people who are giving up their lives to qu qu squash those individuals who don't only want to destroy buildings and um, uh, the lives of our loved ones. They want to destroy freedom and liberty what is the essence of what America is all about, what makes us the greatest nation in the world. And there are going to be people at these like uh, Stephen Caffaro, whose son uh, Peter or Stephen Jr. Uh, Caffaro uh, died on the 92nd floor of the South uh, uh, t Tower that particular day. He was actually on the phone with his mother Grace and uh, she testifies that he, we were talking, he said, I think I'm going to, and then he screamed out, and she believes that the plane was actually, he saw the plane actually coming into that tower, that s uh, south tower. Mm -hmm. uh, but Stephen Cafaro Sr. has turned, I call him a modern day hero he also, just like many of the other family members, because he's turned that personal tragedy into something positive for the rest of us and for America and for our region and for this state. Because he doesn't allow the legacy of his son uh, to go non-remembered. He reminds us every single day, he's wrote a beautiful poem about his son and what, what his life meant for us then and what his life and the lives of those who lost their life mean to us now. And it reminds us that the best way to honor those individuals who lost their lives and to fight this battle is to every single day do what we can do as Americans to stand up for freedom and liberty and not let us be victims. Because if a, a man like that who faced that sorrow in his wife Grace and their family members uh, can not allow themselves to be v uh, victims 
and, st and stand up for everything that his son was about in terms of his service to the community and making his life have meaning and keeping his legacy going and reminding us we can honor them uh, by not accepting this terror that takes place and being a part of the battle to remind those terrorists that uh, you can't destroy America because America is about an idea and that uh, those ideas are freedom and liberty and justice and uh, every child every adult every citizen in every corner of every country and every nation in this world has those same freedoms and liberties and should have that justice because they're inalienable we were born with them we can take advantage of all that because of the men and women first responders on that day who gave up their lives who sacrificed everything to try to save others our best brightest and most compassionate fighting force in the world who are fighting this terrorism mm. and that's the reason why we can fully take advantage of it so uh, Steve Cafaro is one of those modern-day heroes he refused to be a victim. He refused to be bitter and angry and give up. And he keeps the legacy of his son and reminding us to stand up every day for freedom and liberty. And, and Doug Lyle and Mary Lyle are modern day heroes. And uh, uh, we say God bless him. We lost a, a great uh, friend, a great constituent, a great community member, and somebody who uh, turned a very negative uh, situation in his life, the loss of his uh, daughter, into something very positive for the rest of us. We certainly um, do remember them and uh, the 9-11 uh, anniversary coming up, which is 14 years. Um, with only a couple of minutes left, if we could just switch uh, topics, uh, if you don't mind, and talk about this new commission that the governor is creating uh, to uh, address some of the concerns with Common Core and your real thoughts on it. Yeah, yeah. well, first of all, we have SED, we have the new commissioner, Ilya, uh, we have uh, the regents, we have this governor who put this common core situation in place the way it is and failed miserably and uh, very stubborn, uh, uh, failed to listen to the educators, to the parents, to the schools, to the kids. And uh, this uh, governor has a history of commi creating commissions to provide cover for him. He already had one commission on uh, co the common core situation and its implementation. And after that commission, it went from 7% of the parents opting their kids out in 2014 mm. to 20% of the parents saying, these tests are not appropriate. They're not developmentally appropriate for the kids. Uh, they're not age appropriate in terms of grade and the age of the kids. They're being uh, too much testing for too long. They're teaching to the test. Teaching the to the test. And look, individuals say, well, the standards are great. It's the curriculum that's bad. No, the standards are created outside of the classroom, outside of our education. They were created outside of the state of New York by faceless bureaucrats. The tests are outside of our educational system, our educators, and uh, the, the state of New York. So once you have the standards and the test created, the teachers have only one curriculum, and that curriculum is to teach to the tests. And if the tests are developmentally inappropriate, not age appropriate or grade appropriate, the innovation of the teachers is uh, destroyed, and what happens is not innovation, but stagnation, and the love of learning is being destroyed for kids. When you don't have innovation, when you don't have kids loving uh, what they're learning because of the innovation that teachers can provide, it's failure. So we've seen them fail with the Moreland Commission. We've seen them fail with the uh, Mandate Relief Commission, that one mandate. We've seen them already fail with a commission for Common Core, and my concern is they're just going to be spinning their wheels to make believe they're doing something about this and the message to them is this you cannot fool their parents they know when their kids are being attacked and they're being violated and they're being violated and these, these tests are, are creating violence for our kids mm. and the real indictment and I'll close on this is I've never heard that you, uh, schools had to send a memo home to the parents to say here's a suggestion on how to counsel your kids on the stress and anxiety they're going to face on taking tests the simple way to solve this is correct the questions Make sure there's more of a limited time in the utilization of those standardized tests. Make sure standardized tests is one measurement of how you measure kids reaching those levels of excellence and measure teachers. And uh, lastly, make sure that those standardized tests cannot be counted as 50% for evaluating a teacher because they only should be one measurement on a holistic approach. So Good we're enough. going to work very hard to make that happen. Unfortunately, we're out of time. Always a pleasure to see you, Mr. Tedisco. Thank you very much for joining us at home. Until next time, take care.